In 2034, the world will spend more on bottled water than it does on utility water. $598 billion a year spent in Avion, Aquafina, or Dazani. That's more than the GDP of a country like Belgium. But what does that tell us? The Hollywell bottling plant in the United Kingdom is considered to be the first bottling water plant in the world. In 1622, they started filling glass bottles with their mineral water and selling it. The marketing promise behind this move was to offer the medicinal value of that mineral water to people that had no access to the source. That medical claim was the main selling point of water bottles that pharmacies mainly distributed until the early 20th century. Today's point is not into the full details of the bottling history, so I I won't tell you too much about how Johann Jacob Schwepp discovered how to carbonate water in 1783 or how Dupont patented polyethylene terephthalate in 1973, thus opening the market to PET bottles. Indeed, bottled water could have died long before the age of PET. Tap water became much safer at the beginning of the 20th century when disinfection methods became popular, notably ozone and chlorine. And indeed, until the 1970s, bottled water was much of a niche. At the beginning of that decade, only 1 billion liters a year of bottled water was sold in the USA, a good chunk of it being the 5-gallon bottles you could find in the offices. But a revolution was cooking, and as often with revolutions, it came from France. In the late 70s, Perrier was a sparkling water brand essentially distributed in high-end restaurants. But they ambitioned to become much more and to reach the mass market in the USA. So they hired Bruce Nevins and initiated a market blitz with a wealth of TV ads voiced by no less than Orson Welles. Some were pretty classic. Perrier, its natural sparkle is more delicate than any made by man. Some mothers were quite, let's say, edgy. All the specialists were predicting a major failure. It's like selling canned air. Why would people spend a fortune to buy what they can get for a fraction at the tap? Well, that's where everybody was wrong. Perrier wasn't really in the business of selling water. They were selling a lifestyle. Baby boomers had a strong desire for status. Well, Perrier was bringing it in a rounded green bottle. And the taste of France, terroir and fame with all the stars and sports players posing next to it was swiftly making it a Veblen good. Let me pose our story here to explain what a Veblen good actually is. And it's pretty important because what happened in the 70s is currently happening again. So please bear with me. You've probably heard a million times that price is a result of demand. If many people want a good, the price tag increases as the offer may struggle to follow demand. Well, a Veblen good is quite the opposite. People get attracted by a high price tag as it is an easy way to distinguish themselves from the masses that cannot afford such a conspicuous consumption, to use the term coined by Thorstein Veblen in 1899. Sometimes also called the snob effect, that cognitive bias is the one that enables Balenciaga to sell a white t-shirt 100 times its real value by just applying its logo on it. In a nutshell, it's all about stuff that's expensive and hence has to be superior. And that's how Nevin actually created a category, positioning pure Perrier, as the perfect mixer for the fanciest cocktails, as the healthiest partner for your sport activities, or simply as your piece of France in a bottle. That made you special. And experts predicting a failure were somehow right. It did not work. It skyrocketed. In 1980, Perrier had multiplied its sales by 70, then proceeded to acquire its main US competitor and reached 85% share of a booming market. But wait, I see the doubt on your face. You still don't believe that it's all about marketing, right? We're rational human beings, after all. And if you ever tasted Perrier, you and I know that it's simply better than tap water, right? Well, in 1986, Bruce Nevins, that had become Perrier's North American CEO, was trapped into a blind test by KABC Radio, where his own sparkling water was hidden among a dozen of other brands. And guess what? He did not recognize his product and very honestly admitted 
that the value was in the brand, not in the carbonated H2O inside the bottle. So what's left if it's not better? Is it safer? Well, in the 90s, a small number of Perrier bottles were found to contain benzene. Ouch! Sure, sales plummeted, but not to the benefit of tap water, rather as a transfer to Evian or the new brands created by Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Today, in California, 80% of people only drink bottled water, and in a country of iconic soda brands, bottled water surpassed carbonated drinks as the number one beverage in 2017. But there comes our second Veblen good, because if bottled water now becomes a commodity, and you're still a hipster wanting to distinguish yourself from the masses, how do you deal with that? You could return to tap water, as your grandparents did. Sure. It's vintage. Or you could open a brand new market segment. And guess what happened? Today you can drink iceberg water, which is guaranteed to come from a melted iceberg. Thank you, global warming. It will only cost you about $140 for one bottle. Or you can go for BLK water, a water which is actually black, thanks to its healthful big mineral content. And sometimes it's even more straightforward with, for instance, bling water. I mean, if you're seeking a definition of a bad and good, here it goes. I think you got my point, so let's zoom out. Are all consumers of bottled water victims of marketing? Well, sadly, no. Remember my introduction? The investments in bottled water may take over utility water in 2034. But today, apart from Mexico and a close call in the US, utility is still ahead. And if the world is on the track to raise its bottled investment from $123 billion in 2015 to $429 billion in 2030, it's widely because utilities will fail to close the water gap themselves by then. If you remember the UN Sustainable Development Goal number 6 we already touched on, it boils down to enabling universal access to water and sanitation. Let's face it, we are far from achieving this target even on the water side. Utilities don't get sufficient funding today in most places around the world to sustain their existing assets, and this in turn means that they are far from investing in the additional capacity that may bring drinking water to every household. And I'm not even addressing intermittent service, water scarcity, or non-revenue water here. We would have to make a specific deep dive for that. And spoiler, we will. Now, it's hard to live without water, so bottled water is a safe and convenient alternative if you can't find water anywhere else. Safe? Convenient, but expensive. When you spend 500 billion on bottled water, you don't get the same amount of water than when you spend 500 billion on utility infrastructure. Yet, I'm honestly not sure either that pushing everywhere the traditional central utility approach would be a much better solution than getting all our drinking water in bottles. Large infrastructure comes with its own caveats, ranging from inefficiencies and high operating costs to heavy capital needs through diverging incentives and even corruption. But does it really have to be this blue pill, red pill alternative? Well, again, no. I'm not sure it's a positive thing for the world to let bottling companies and utilities fight in a lose-lose war where utilities only underline how cheaper they are while bottling companies create ads that degrade people's trust in their tap water. But there are in fact dozens of other avenues to explore, so it's maybe time to be creative. Let's pick only one for today and let's take the words number three as we speak, point of use treatment. Indeed, point of use has a bit of the beauty of the in-between. The principle is to treat water, as the name states, at its point of use. In the developed world, it often takes the shape of an under-the-sink unit, while in the developing world we see two types of systems, tabletop gravity-fed filters, remember my conversation with Srinath Bolizetti from Blue Act, or small arrow UV devices. We could also factor in here atmospheric water generation. Have a look at my discussion with Navgaran Singh Baga from Agpo to that extent. When operated and maintained the right way, all these units will deliver satisfactory drinking water quality. So you can forget about the trust issue in utility water while avoiding the hassle of collecting and disposing of bottles. If you even want to reproduce the taste of your favorite mineral water, that's possible. Check my discussion with Jacob Bossar from Bossac. But what about the costs? A typical developed world system costs $200 to $500 for the unit, along with a $60 to $80 annual running cost. Assuming a replacement every five years, the total yearly cost is thus $130 to $180. Let's compare it to bottled water now. In a bulk pack, 
and in the Western world, it costs 35 to 50 cents per liter, not accounting for the time needed to do your groceries, the gasoline and the maintenance of your car, and assuming you don't go for iceberg water. That brings our cost per capita for bottled water to about $450 and the annual cost for an average 2.5 people household to $1,125. So we can estimate that point of use water is seven times cheaper than bottled water in developed countries. But how about the developing economy? Gravity-fed tabletop unit cost about $19 to $43 plus $5 to $10 per year to replace the cartridges. Assuming a three-year lifetime for your unit, the total annual cost is $11 to $25. Then you could also go for our UV units, which cost $75 to $190, with an annual running cost of $15 to $50. With a 5-year lifetime, that makes a total yearly cost of $30 to $90. In a 20-liter jar, basic bottled water costs about $1.2, which makes for $6 cent per liter. We thus get an annual cost of $77 and an annual charge for the average 4.5 people household of $353. You like numbers, right? So let's compare. A simple tabletop cartridge unit costs $11 to $25 per year and household. A more advanced ROUV costs $30 to $90 and the most basic bottled water $353. So point of use is 4 to 30 times cheaper than bottled water. Now, point of use does not need to be designed for single households neither. We could imagine winning additional scale effect and cross efficiencies at the district level. That would turn point of use into decentralized treatments and micro utilities. Kind of a 21st century reinterpretation of the utility, leveraging the power of digitization while skipping the part where you have to lay hundreds of kilometers of enormous pipes. But that's a different story we will cover another time. Now, if there's something that the aspiring solution shall copy from the bottled water industry, it's for sure it's marketing. Here's a suggestion. Microbreweries are booming, right? So what if the next identity move for hipsters of all kinds was to support the development of their local micro-utility? And if you have a better idea of how to promote tap and point of use water, well, come tell me in the comments. See you soon. Tap water, reassuringly expensive.